Just to give a little bit of a primer of an overview, uh, let's start with the construction of a traditional LED uh, lighting string. I took apart a string I had and was able to determine that it's a string of LEDs uh, in opposite directions. So half of the LEDs are on at a given time and in this particular string, and my understanding is there are differences depending on which manufacturer, uh, there were 25 LEDs in each particular direction. So the characteristics will be a function of those number of LEDs and their particular uh, forwarding voltage and maximum currents and breakdown voltage and all that stuff. There's a, another resistor in there. In this particular string, the resistor value uh, was 2... So I took out one of the LEDs that was in the string in order to measure its characteristics. And for this particular string, which I think was a white light LED color string, the forward voltage was equal to 2.6 volts. So for the total number of strings, the amount of voltage it would take across the AC plug that's what this represents is the incoming AC voltage uh, will be a function of the total number of LEDs and the forwarding voltage so for the sake of this conversation let's call that forward voltage total which will be 2.6 volts times the 25 volts so it's going to be equal to 65 volts so from a practical perspective, we have our incoming AC power waveform. And in this case, we'll assume 120 volts RMS. So voltage RMS equals 120 volts AC. Recognizing house power is a little lower, 110 or 115, but we'll just keep it simple. So in this case, the voltage max is equal to 120 volts times the square root of 2. So about 170 volts, 169 volts. So the bottom will be a negative 169 volts. So for the rising voltage portion, we'll get this portion of the lights on and the negative voltage, this portion will be on based on creating a current flow path. And uh, in this case, there's probably another line that ties in one of these so you have a current return path not through. But in this case, We'll just keep it as a simplified diagram. So for the total forward voltage of being 65 volts, we'll get no current flowing until such point that the voltage rises to 65 volts. And in the other direction, we'll get no current flowing for the other set of string of lights until it's negative 65 volts. So if we assume that that's some point here, There will be a portion of the AC waveform in both directions that is never on, uh, never forward biases the LEDs, so we'll not have any light. So, although we would normally be able to control voltage across a wide, control the power, the photonic output of the LEDs across a, a wide scope, we're kind of now dealing with a sliver of some much smaller percentage of the total AC waveform that will actually give us a control surface, if you will, for the power output. So there's part of the control where turning it on and off won't matter because the light's not really on at that point either. I think I did a rough calculation and it actually turns out, and I haven't drawn it very symmetrically here, but it turns out to be something like 35% of the waveform is when we're actually providing usable voltage. So it'll probably actually look something like this to get that right voltage. So Traditionally, when the AC power is all the way on and we're not doing a control circuit that's chopping that power, the total current will be flowing in this particular portion of the circuit, and that'll be, based on the equation, will work out to be what sort of, sort of power can be available to be converted to photons and therefore affect the light that's seen uh, by those of us looking at the lights. So, recalling that 
power equals voltage times current for instantaneous power in this case we're dealing with an AC circuit and the voltage here is a function of a sine wave it is going to be the voltage maximum so 120 volts times the square root of 2 and it's a function of the sine wave and in this case for a given time measured in milliseconds times the in this case uh, the frequency is 60 so to convert from radians it'll be 2 pi frequency so 2 pi times 60 it works out to 377 volts so this simplify that equation 169 volts times the sine of T377 is the voltage part and the current will be a corresponding let's see if we figure out what the current would be in this case the current is always going to be a function of the the voltage of instantaneous voltage it'll be the whatever the voltage is so whatever the voltage for this particular equation is so call that V prime at this point um, minus the forward voltage total VFT over the value of the resistor in this case R is 2395 so to work that out 169 minus 65 so this would be the maximum case we're at the peak portion so we'll rephrase that call that V max divided by 2395 in this case this really becomes a function of I max but that will correspond to a, a, a separate cosine function that we can use later on if we we choose to carry this equation out so just crunching that on the calculator real quick would be and this will represent the maximum current that would flow is 43.4 milliamps so the best case we'll have for instantaneous voltage will be at this point at the very top when the voltage is the maximum and so we have 43.4 milliamps so instead of this being I this is I as a function of V and it becomes a longer equation but it'd be the 169 sine T377 minus the forward voltage total that we would figured out in this case is always going to be the same. It's going to be a constant where you could put in the original so 65 all over the value of R in this case we already said 2395 so one could you know plot this and figure out well if I take this given area this control surface from from zero degrees to to in this case what would normally be pi if this was a trigonometric function but would be a function now of time actually works out to be one twentieth of a second and whereas this is one sixtieth of a second over here so you know eight point three milliseconds something of that nature and the sixteen six milliseconds here you'd figure out um, within your software how much time something has to be on or off within this area to give you a resulting percentage output and at the end that's really what this this conversation is all about is I'm going to have some sort of a software function built into my microcontroller that helps me choose how long I have to turn something on or off to get a corresponding change in the, the visual effect of the LED so in this case I, I want to focus a lot less about predetermining and figuring out as a function of solving uh, that sine equation calculation for the total power and talk a little bit about how I implemented that within my particular software so if you recall from the previous uh, conversations about the circuit uh, I happen to know when these points are in time within a given AC waveform even for some variability within the frequency of the incoming AC power uh, that's because I have a zero cross detector and a zero cross positive polarity detector circuit built in so basically anytime this incoming AC power waveform happens to cross zero volts I have a pulse that is 
sensible on the input of my microcontroller so I know for, for no kidding exactly when these occur. If you were to implement this circuit with some assumptions about where you are in the AC waveform, it would probably be pretty difficult and you'd have some instability to contend with. So for the sake of this conversation, let's assume I know when these zero cross points are. So for a given waveform, and it would be the same whether you're rising or falling, just affecting two different parts of your circuit, one half of the LED string or the other, you know when this event occurs. In my case, I use this particular crossing to generate an interrupt signal that lets me know where I am. And I initiate, at that time, a timer countdown. In, in my case, timer register zero. And in that particular pick, pick 16C745, there are two timers, timer zero, timer one. I did the entire countdown function within timer zero but you could do it and, and get greater fidelity in multiple timers. This happens to be an 8-bit timer, so if it is only 8 bits, the total number of values in there I have is 2 to 8, so 256 total, total bit combinations. Uh, this happens to be an overflow timer, so if I were to set this at in hex notation here, 0x00, zero zero zero, it would begin to time and I would generate a second interrupt as soon as it crosses the 0FF threshold. So let's assume that based on the incoming clock and oscillator frequency, my prescalers have been set up so that, that this point represents 0 and this is FF so that I have in this case basically a timer that gives me the, the maximum fidelity within the 8.3 milliseconds that one would have. Now the notation is backwards, this is really the time till overflow. Uh, to get this I would set the timer at FF and it would instantly go to interrupt. To get to here I'd actually set my timer at zero and it would have to count up through the prescaling 255 additional clicks to get to value FF to trigger the overflow. So let's say in this particular example I had calculated that I needed the AC power to turn on at this particular point so that this portion of the waveform, again here this is my forward biasing B voltage for total, uh, so this portion of the AC waveform in voltage is what would be applied across that, that entire load and current limited by that resistor to correspond with the power level I want. That looks like that might be something like 40% uh, of the total power. So this might be, I, I set it to 40, whereas back here maybe it would be something that corresponds to 60%. Again, you'd have to solve that equation uh, or throw in an Excel table to figure it out. So basically what I've done in this case is I've preloaded my timer register at this interrupt point to a particular value that based on this distance in a predefined lookup table will cause an interrupt overflow at this point and corresponding to that interrupt overflow I'm turning on the output of the AC waveform and again if you recall you have your AC waveform then you have a PWM circuit providing a control function and this causes a latching of the triac so you get the corresponding voltage waveforms here and in this case giving us to apply that amount of voltage to the particular load. So I think it's a pretty common approach uh, but if you haven't thought about it or played with it before I, it's maybe not something uh, that people come across every day so I thought I'd give that a little bit of, of uh, overview and I think the trick is really recognizing that this value, the voltage forward total, is not the same for every set of lights. So if you have some manufacturing differences between your lights, uh, you 40% at one might be 60% at another as this total accessible control surface of the AC wave changes. So you may wish to, in your particular software implementation, put in some sort of a, uh, a corresponding calibration number, something that allows you to take your basic uh, availability of that AC waveform knowing that you have 256 slices and that the summation of those underneath the curve is going to have a, a linear corresponding relationship to the power delivered to the load. You may want to come up and figure out what those that number difference is for an average one and then tweak it higher or low as necessary for your particular uh, product if you if you really need that level of control. If you need just a basic level of control or a cycling of those uh, 
of the voltages to give you a, a corresponding cycle of your, your light output, you probably wouldn't even notice the difference.